It is such a pleasure to be here. I have to tell you, Luxembourg is one of the most beautiful cities and I really hope you guys appreciate how wonderful it is to live here. Uh, every time I come back, I'm just amazed at the beautiful scenery that you have in your backyard. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, we've been working with the collaborators here for the last five years actually on the elimination of hepatitis C in Luxembourg. Uh, but at the same time, we've been working with about 98 other countries as well. And so what I'll tell you about today is about some of that work and how we're doing on the global elimination of hepatitis C. Now, these are my disclosures. Um, as a nonprofit organization, none of us are allowed to accept any funding from the industry, uh, although we are asked to be on advisory board. So all that proceeds actually goes to the foundation, and we use that to sponsor projects around the world. Uh, about 70 to 80 percent of our funding actually comes from other nonprofits or government agencies like USCDC and the WHO. Um, and about 20 to 30 percent actually comes specifically for projects, epidemiology projects around the world. Um, and our more recent, the last three years, we've got funding from Gilead Sciences, AbV, Intercept. All right, just tell you a little bit about ourselves and, and what we do. Um, how many people have heard of CDA and CDA Foundation? Exactly. So um, CDA Foundation is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are designed, uh, we are designated as a nonprofit in the U.S. Uh, and our goal is to assist countries in achieving the 2030 elimination targets. Uh, we have a board of directors who oversees our work around the world, and we have two major initiatives. Um, the first one is the Polaris Observatory. Um, Polaris Observatory has been down actually, unfortunately, for the last year, year and a half. Um, as of next month, it will be going back up again. Um, and uh, what it does is it goes country by country and actually collects data, um, actually validates the data, and develops mathematical models for what is the current burden associated with Hep B and Hep C, what's the economic impact, and then what would be the burden uh, associated with if they achieve the elimination targets. So we've been doing this actually since 2012, um, and uh, we have relationships with about a thousand uh, experts around the world, as well as ministries of health um, and uh, statistician. Now in 2016, uh, what became obvious was we were spending a lot of time with countries, uh, helping them develop strategies, but those strategies weren't implemented. Um, so if you look at, let's say a hundred countries that we work with, uh, about, 12 to 20 are on path to elimination. Um, that's not a very good success rate. So that's about a 10% to 20% success rate. What we'd like to do is get that to about 50% to 80%. Um, and the key barrier is actually the financing and the, uh, the procurement, that's you know, where to get medication. Um, and so we formed a global procurement fund. Um, GPRO, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, uh, is actually a pulled procurement similar to global fund but specifically for viral hepatitis, where we go and buy large volumes of diagnostics, uh, medication, um, and then we provide that to the countries um, at cost, actually. Now, we're also now working on how to optimize the testing and treatment algorithm as well. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the Uzbekistan program that we're doing today. As I mentioned, uh, we work with about 98 countries. Um, 130 countries region, so there's always a debate of whether Taiwan is a country or a, a part of China. We're not going to get into that, uh, but, but depending on the math, we're somewhere between 98 and 130. Um, and every country that you see in red are countries that we have gone, visited, we've sat down with the experts in those countries to help them develop their national strategies. More importantly, we've also done economic analysis because one of the key barriers is, you know, how do we actually pay for these uh, programs? Uh, and we've done that for about 40 countries. And remember, we actually do it for both hepatitis B as well as hepatitis C. And then finally, one of the key um, requests that came back from the countries is, look, how is hepatitis transmitted? And can we actually look at the transmission uh, of, of the disease and prevention in those populations? And so uh, we also have worked with 15 countries on transmission-specific models. Now, my background uh, for the last 20 years, um, actually 25 years now, uh, have, is, is really decision analysis. So I'm, I, I don't do epidemiology. 
uh, I wasn't trained uh, in medicine either. But it's really how do you support good decision making? Um, I did that for about 12 years in pharmaceutical industry, uh, really working with the companies to really optimize decision making around which drugs to develop. And starting in 2012, we decided, well, we're going to shift all of our efforts into public health. Uh, we thought that we could make a much bigger impact globally if we applied the same technique in the public health. And, and that's really what these are about. So these are mostly mathematical models that really are designed to help policymakers make good decisions. Now, they can ignore the, the data and decide not to do anything about it. That's OK. But at least they have the information. Now, what we have is a team of uh, epidemiologists. So we have eight epidemiologists in the organization. We have modelers. We have three modelers and actually a programmer as well who, who work with us. So that expertise resides actually in the organization. But the essence of what we do is decision support. How do we actually help countries make better decisions? Now, again, very few people have actually heard of us. But if you actually look at the the great achievements in the world of viral hepatitis, we've actually been behind a number of them. We can't say we caused those. Causality is very, very difficult to show, but we certainly influenced them. Uh, so when Unitaid actually started funding uh, the co-infected population, a year prior to that, we actually developed a report uh, for Unitaid showing that the, what impact they could have in terms of lives saved uh, if they, the Unitaid got involved. The WHO targets, actually, by the time the WHO actually started working on their targets, um, we had actually already published what, it would, what would be the impact of eliminating viral hepatitis, specifically hepatitis C, in about 46 countries. So when they got together and were developing the, you know, the targets that I'll show you in a few minutes, remember, we had already done that. In fact, Luxembourg was part of the original study where we showed that you would have a massive impact. And we've done that with medicine's patent pool. Um, the, the fact we were the organization that brought the prevalence, the global prevalence of hepatitis C down from 180 million down to 71 million. And, and that was actually endorsed by WHO finally in 2017. Um, and, and we continue to really to develop some breakthrough uh, analyses in terms of what can be done with viral hepatitis. And, and, and we, we haven't seen the result of all of that. Um, so in fact, what we're working on now is to show that test and treatment of all Hep B patients is actually more cost effective um, than, than the current standard guidelines. So if you're familiar with hepatitis B, if you're diagnosed with hepatitis B, you have to be cirrhotic, you have to be above a certain age uh, in order to qualify, or, or a viral load uh, in order to qualify for treatment. 20 to 30 percent of patients are actually eligible for treatment. 70 to 80 percent are turned away and are asked to come back annually uh, to be retested to see if they qualify for treatment. Guess what happens to those patients in low and middle income countries? They never come back. And so when they come back, they have advanced uh, cirrhosis or liver cancer. And so what we see is a very, very large burden, sp specifically in Africa and Central Asia, as a result of hepatitis B. And we strongly believe that it's time to actually shift that paradigm, very similar to what HIV did. Remember, with HIV, there was a requirement for CD4 count, and we finally decided that we're going to treat all HIV patients. And right now, we're promoting that. Now, when you're ahead, when you're actually kind of coming up with these recommendations, um, people get very, very upset. Uh, and believe me, every liver society right now is quite mad at us for even suggesting this. And, and if you've been in any of the email chains, uh, they're quite upset the fact that this has even been brought up. But the same groups were actually quite upset when we suggested that the global prevalence was 71 million. Um, you know, they, they basically came back and said, that, you know, there's no evidence. And so it took us a few years, and it takes about two or three years to get consensus, and then everybody finally comes around. Um, and so we fundamentally believe that in two or three years, we will be treating all happy patients. Right now, we're kind of going through the rough, uh, uh, rough debate. And that's part of the scientific uh, debate, isn't it? That we have to have these discussions. Let's talk about the, uh, the WHO elimination targets. So if, if you're familiar with those, um, essentially what you have is you have a series of um, requirements, um, and then you have a series of outcomes um, that, that will 
that, that, that you will see. So essentially what WHO is saying is, look, we need to have birth dose and three dose vaccinations uh, for, all have be, for all infants actually. So that's given. Um, the, the blood has to be safe. Um, so if donated blood has to be screened uh, for hepatitis B and C, it seems to be a no brainer in the 21st century. But in fact, uh, there's still considerable infection as a result of unscreened blood uh, in low and middle income countries, especially in, in private uh, labs actually. In India and other parts of the world, um, the families will actually bring donors with them. So if they have a family member who's having surgery, they'll bring a donor and they pay the donor and that blood is not screened either. Um, so part of the goals is, look, we got to get rid of these practices. Um, and then uh, there's also the injection safety. So uh, th this is another huge problem globally. Uh, we, we have the luxury of having disposable syringes, uh, but in most part of the world, especially in low and middle income countries, they're still using glass syringes. Um, and, and in fact, if you've seen pictures of them, you know, essentially they have little containers of disinfectants or um, alcohol that they put the syringes, they kind of shake it and then they reuse the syringes. Um, and in fact, if you look at the global level, the majority of the Hep B and Hep C infections continue to be nosocomial and nitrogenic. Um, and so this was one of the goals that as part of this program, elimination goals that we will have a safe injection. Now, um, if you're familiar with Hep C, uh, as you know, the, uh, the key risk factor in Western countries is injection drug use. Um, and so there are actually goals about harm reduction for among injection drug users. It's not so much globally, uh, but in Western countries, uh, Western Europe, uh, US, North America, and then um, Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, injection drug use is a huge, huge problem actually. So th those are some of the key interventions. Um, and then what about the specifically treatment and diagnosis? So WHO requires that by 2030, we uh, diagnose 90% of all infections and then treat 80% of the eligible population. If we do all that, uh, what we should get is about an 80% reduction in incidence and a 65% reduction in mortality associated with that. Okay, so these are the overall goals. This is what every country should be doing. And we're gonna go over uh, how countries are doing actually against these goals. So let's step back, take a look to see uh, where the burden is um, and then how, how the countries are actually doing. So this is the block paper that came out in 2017, uh, really described the, uh, it was really an update of the original paper, the Gower paper that we published that reported 71 million. But it, it really highlights the, uh, the, the prevalence uh, of hep C around the world. Um, so we have actually two scales in, in, this, in this particular graph. The color represents the percent of the population which is infected with hep C. So you look at, for example, Mongolia, you look at Russia, um, you look at Egypt. These are all red, very, very high prevalence, uh, you know, higher than 3%. The size of the bubble corresponds to the number of people that are infected. So if you look at, for example, India, uh, the color is green, right? So less than 1% of all Indian population is actually infected with hep C. However, India has a very, very large population, and so the number of people who are infected in India is actually quite large. Um, and so that's what we need to actually look at both when we're looking at national strategy, uh, because from a national budget perspective, the total number of infections is actually more important than the, the prevalence. Now, in, in Western Europe, um, we have a, a separate problem. As you can see, the majority of the countries are green, which means the prevalence is low. So it's, it's quite expensive when the prevalence is low, it is to find those who are infected. If you're in Egypt and you throw a stone, you have a one in 15 chance of hitting someone who's hep C infected, right? When the prevalence is very high, it's very easy to actually find people who are hep C infected. In fact, every family has someone who's been infected with hep C in Egypt or Pakistan. Little more difficult in Luxembourg or in Germany or France uh, when the prevalence is less than 1%. And so um, it, it does actually provide the specific challenges in how do you actually diagnose this population and bring them to care. Now, we just finished a large study uh, for the pediatric population. So these are the actually in press, uh, so it hasn't been published yet. Uh, but we do estimate about 3.2 million children actually infected. 
uh, with hep C. Um, and, and there's two main reasons for that. One is the, uh, the iatrogenic. Um, so actually, children are getting infected as the result of medical procedures, whether it's dental procedures or, or just getting vaccinated with uh, infected syringes. Uh, but then in high-income countries, it's really mother-to-child transmission. Um, so as a result of the injection drug use epidemic that we're seeing in North America and Western Europe, you have a lot of females of childbearing age uh, who are now infected with hep C. The mother-to-child transmission is about 5%, so it's not large. But when you have a large number of people who are infected that are young in that age group, you do start getting a sizable number of uh, infants who are born actually infected with hep C. Um, this will come out in Lancet actually in, by, by, by the end of December. And if we look at globally, uh, you know, as you would expect, uh, countries with large population account for most of the infections among children. So these are all, every, all children less than 18 years old. Pakistan um, leads the way. They do have a huge, huge problem with nosocomial iatrogenic infection, followed by China, India, Nigeria, Egypt, Russia. These are, again, countries with large population um, and, and high prevalence. All right, so what about the, um, the globally, what, what the numbers look like? I think what we, we forget is the, the incredible burden that viral hepatitis actually represents. Every 80 seconds, somebody dies of hep C. For hep B, every 30 seconds, someone dies of hep B. This is a huge, huge burden. And if you look at the total number of people who are diagnosed globally, less than 80% are actually uh, diagnosed, oh, sorry, less than 20% are actually diagnosed and less than 2% are actually treated. That's a huge, huge problem. So the question is, why aren't public health agencies um, and donors are actually coming and really supporting um, the elimination efforts? Um, and it's really the, the pie chart on the bottom. Um, the, if you look at Global Fund, if you look at PEPFAR, their main focus is low-income countries only 8% of all infections are in low income. So, so why is so little actually low income? Low income countries have very few medical procedures. That is one good thing about having poor access to medical is you're less likely to be infected with viral hepatitis, right? And so in fact, where we see a large increase, uh, a large prevalence is in middle income countries uh, where there were a lot of uh, medical procedures. A, a good example, and this is an outlier, but it is a good example, is Egypt. Egypt, back in the 70s, had a campaign to eradicate schistosomiasis. Um, and so they went around a campaign to actually uh, inject everyone uh, to protect against schistosomiasis. Um, and they were using glass syringes. 15% of all Egyptians are infected with hep C as a result of that specific campaign. Um, so, in fact, medical procedures do have an impact, and we've seen the same thing in Mongolia, in ex-Soviet republics, where there was the in injection campaigns, whether it was vaccination or other injection forms, which infected the population. So the high prevalence you see very often gets tied into specific campaigns and national programs. Western countries is different. It's injection drug use, and we want to be clear. But globally, Western countries actually represent very small percent. So high-income countries account for 20% of all infections. 80% of all infections actually are outside of high-income countries. Yet the global donors will not get involved because only 8% are actually in low-income countries. So we're now we're in this dilemma of how we're going to support or how we're going to fund these programs. Now what's interesting is if you look at the cascade of care by income, um, so 8 million people are infected in high-income countries as compared to 32 million in lower-middle-income countries, right? But take a look at the blue bars and the percentages. 42% of all hep C infections in high-income countries have already been diagnosed. Compare that to 9% in low-income. In, in fact, it just follows the income level. So you go 42%, 24%, 12%, 9% follows it exactly. And the same thing actually with, uh, with, high, with the uh, treatment. So 5% of uh, all patients are actually treated on an annual basis in 2017. If you go to low-income countries, it's about 0.5%. So fairly rapid drop actually 
compared to the national uh, income level. Now, the good news is, if you, if you look at the total number of people who have been, uh, who've been treated, in fact, numbers have been increasing, um, and that's pretty exciting. Um, so in 2017, it was about 2 million, 2.1 million. 2018, it was about 2 million, actually. And I'll go into a little bit of why that is. So that's good news, right? The bad news is the majority of that growth actually came in middle-income countries. What you see in, in the green, the green lines actually shows high-income countries. What we saw was an increase in the number of treated patients, and now we're starting to see actually a decline. So year after year, fewer patients, Hep C patients, are being treated actually in high-income countries. Um, and this is a little bit like a canary in the mine. So what we're seeing in middle-income countries is going to actually follow the same trend. Um, so that we, had, we see this sharp increase, and we're going to start seeing the, uh, a decrease in, in these countries as well. It's only because high-income countries, low-middle-income countries actually uh, started a little bit later. Uh, but in fact, I'll show you some data from Egypt that they started seeing actually the same trend. So, so why is that? Uh, it's because with hepatitis C, you essentially have a bolus of diagnosed patients who were waiting for these treatments. Once they became available, they came in seeking for treatment. These were motivated, diagnosed patients. And once that pool was depleted, uh, there aren't a sufficient number of patients to actually treat. So you have countries literally run out of patients to treat, uh, countries like Germany, um, e even US. So if you look at the national level, what we're looking at here is uh, US, uh, there was a sharp increase in 2015, and we've seen a decrease. Japan have seen a sharp decrease. Australia, in fact, Australia in another year will be below the threshold required to achieve the elimination targets. And we've seen the same thing in Luxembourg, and thanks to Carol uh, for providing this data, actually. Um, so the DAs became available. Uh, the restrictions were removed. We saw a sharp increase, um, and then the numbers have started to decrease. Now, what's becoming obvious is that we are going to see the exact same trend in every country unless we have universal screening. Remember we talked about ideas that are controversial? This is one of them. So in about three years, we're going to see people talking about universal screening. Right now, there's a lot of debate, actually, of whether that should be done. The answer is yes, it has to be done. If, if you look at this data fairly closely, we're not going to achieve the elimination targets without universal screening. And in fact, there were published papers uh, in France and Poland both showing that universal screening in hepatitis C is cost effective. So if we look at globally, of the 45 high income, so this is an analysis that we actually showed at EASL uh, this year. And we only look at high income. We said, look, these are the countries that can obviously afford to pay for the treatment and, and screening and diagnosis. Of the high-income countries, only 20% are going to be able to achieve the elimination targets by 2030. So that's Iceland, Spain, France, Australia, Japan, Italy, Switzerland, UK, and South Korea. The rest are not. Um, so, you know, if Austria, Germany, and Malta change their policies, they could potentially squeeze in. But all the other high-income countries that are not listed are not going to achieve it till after 2050. And that includes the U.S., actually, and Canada. So, uh, you know, the key message here is, unless we do something differently, we're not going to be able to achieve these targets. So we start actually looking. Um, and and we, we work with these countries, we go back and forth, we look at their national strategies. Very often we help shape the national strategies. And we said, look, what are the, uh, the factors that can predict whether a country is going to achieve the, the elimination targets? And we were able to identify eight factors. Um, and I'll start with number two, actually. So um, factor number two is that the government has to finance um, the national program. No financing, there's just, if, if no financing, there's no money, you're basically not going to see it. Um, they're going to have to implement harm reduction program. It's not a, such a problem in, in Luxembourg. It's not a huge problem in Western Europe. But it is a huge problem in, in, in Russia, in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, where injection drug use is not even recognized. Uh, we work in, in a country in Central Asia where about 2 million um, 
tons of heroin goes from Afghanistan to country north of them. We ask them if they have injection drug use problem. They don't. It's like, I just want to make sure this is clear, right? You got two million tons of heroin moving through the country and no one within the country injects. Nope, injection drug use is not a problem. We have to have a harm reduction and we have to accept the fact that people do inject. Um, the other is the expansion of capacity beyond specialists. Um, there's just not enough specialists in low and middle income countries to treat everyone. And this is just a fact. I mean, if, if you do, you've done any work in Africa, there's just not enough hepatologists and gastroenterologists to treat everyone. And in fact, um, the ASCEND study showed that with proper training, nurse practitioners and physicians actually had achieved the same SVR as a specialist. So it's quite doable. Uh, we work with the University of Maryland now quite closely. They're the one that actually developed uh, this particular study and they have a training module. Three days of training, you, know, you train nurse practitioners, you train uh, primary care physicians, and, and they can treat someone, actually anyone with hep C. Now, if they have advanced liver disease, if they have HCC or cirrhosis, then it makes sense to actually um, refer them to a specialist. But 80 to 90 percent of the patients will not have advanced uh, cirrhosis or HCC, so in fact you can actually treat them uh, in a local setting. Um, remove treatment restriction. This was a huge problem in, in Western Europe actually, uh, until about 2018 when restrictions were removed. In the U.S., we still have this problem. Um, so people have to be alcohol free for 12 months, they have to be drug free for 12 months before they're eligible for treatment. Um, we're working with the state of Colorado. If, if you're familiar with Colorado, you know, we legalized marijuana um, and, uh, and so we were in front of the state board and they were saying, yeah, they have to be, you know, 12 months drug free uh, before you're eligible for treatment. It's like, look, marijuana is legal. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, you're going to do a blood test. Of course you're going to find marijuana in, in their blood. And so it took us actually, what we did was we worked with a patient group and we sued the state. Uh, and then the state finally removed those restrictions. That, that's one, you know, accomplishment. There are 50 states and, and unfortunately there's still a number, or close to half of them would still have restrictions actually. The other is we have to have monitoring and evaluation. And we, I've worked with, uh, the, the, with Carol and others. And, you know, the nice thing about the Luxembourg is you guys have an amazing database and registry system to keep track of these people. It doesn't exist. They have no idea. In many countries, they have no idea how many HCC cases they have, how many cirrhotic patients they have. They have no idea how many people have been diagnosed. Uh, and so that's, that's critical if you're going to achieve elimination. And then uh, uh, implement awareness program. Um, and, and actually national screening. So really about, you know, really going after universal screening. And, and this is one of my now pet projects is to start really working on, on universal screening in every country. Um, so this is Will Roger. He was an actor and a cowboy uh, from the U.S. And, and what he said is, it's not what we don't know that gives us trouble. It's what we know that ain't so, right? So what is it that we're assuming to be true today that's just not working? And, and I would argue that essentially all of our strategies around infectious diseases is based on infections that have very, very short incubation period. So if you're an infectious disease specialist or you're looking at epidemi epidemiologists, most of infectious diseases that we work with have an incubation. You see the signs and symptoms within days or weeks of infection. So in fact, if you, if you look at the textbook definition of elimination for infectious disease is to reduce incidence. It has nothing to do with the burden. The assumption is you reduce incidence and you're gonna reduce the burden as well, right? So if you do it for, for measles, you do it for hep hepatitis A, you do it for mumps, you reduce the burden as well. Well, what if you have an infection that takes 20 years before you see uh, the, uh, the burden, right? That's hep hepatitis B, hepatitis C, human papillomavirus. The definitions we have for elimination for infectious diseases is not working for these, for these infections. For infections where it takes 20 to 30 years before you see the signs and symptoms, it's not working. So, so let me expand on that. 
if, if you want to look at chickenpox, if you want to look at dengue fever or, or cholera, where would you go testing, actually? You would focus on high-risk population, right? That's where you do the screening and you really drive your campaign toward. The problem with hepatitis C is you had people who were infected 20 years ago. Now, they may have injected, but they're no longer injecting. So much of our effort is actually focused today on high-risk populations among injection drug users, those who are in prison. If you do the math, they only account for 20 to 30 percent of all infections. So the majority of people who are infected with hep C are actually not coming to these centers. They're out in the community. They partied back in the 70s. They partied back in the 80s. They got a black a blood transfusion prior to 1990s. We're not going to find them. The reason that Australia may actually miss their targets so Australia has free access for everyone, but their focus has been injection drug users. Active injection drug users in Australia account for 20% of all infections. And if you look at the numbers in Australia, every year the number of treated patients is coming down because they continue to focus on high-risk population. What we need to do is actually go outside of the high-risk communities and start doing universal screening to be able to find them. And this is the paradigm shift. If our paradigm is that the sign and symptoms show up a few days or a few weeks, that strategy works really well. If it takes 20 years, that strategy doesn't work so well. And so we're kind of stuck in that, and unfortunately it's going to take some time to get around that. Okay. And then uh, finally, linkage to care program. Again, uh, I think there's some incredibly good practices here in, in Luxembourg. And we've seen some great practices in countries like Scotland, uh, in Australia, where once the patient is actually diagnosed, they're actually getting, getting linked to care. So we went through this list, and it was pretty surprising because you get countries who on paper actually will, you get a check mark for all of that. But then you step back, and, and they're obviously not going to achieve the, the targets. And, and a good example is Turkey. Uh, and what we found is, is actually political will is that the key predictor of whether a country is going to be able to achieve the elimination target is if there is political will. So Turkey will say, look, we have access to everyone. There's no restriction. We're funding the national program, um, and we do have a registry. But in fact, they only make the drugs available in about 20 hospitals. It's not accessible to everyone. Right? So it makes it very difficult for patients to actually access that. We see similar issues. If there's political will, and what we've seen is actually countries go out of their way to remove any barriers for the patients to actually get. And, and that's the key. So how do we, CDF Foundation, work with the governments to actually drive and build up political will? And the question is, on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we actually make this happen? Um, and, and really to do that, uh, what we need to do is to measure the percent of the population that's treated. So if they're treating more than 7%, they're doing well. Good example is Egypt. Um, so what you're looking at the graph on top is the number of patients that are treated. So we worked with the Egyptian Ministry of Health, and uh, we did some modeling for them, and said, look, if you treat 350,000 people annually, um, you're going to be able to achieve the elimination targets. Now, in fact, not only they did that, uh, but they actually expanded treatment. But what they started seeing in 2018 is they started running out of patients. So these are the number of treated, the monthly number of treated patients in, in Egypt. And then it started really tanking. So most countries at this point will say, look, we basically treated everyone and, and we're done. But what the Egyptian government did was they started a national screening campaign in 2018. And from 2018 to today, they've screened over 52 million people. Think about on a daily basis how many people you're going to have to screen in order to be able to find, to test that many people. And, and sure enough, uh, there are plenty of he hepatitis C infections. So about 4.6% of everyone who was adults um, were actually positive. Uh, and so they were able to find uh, those individuals. And in fact, Egypt. They're not listed on the high-income country because they're actually middle-income country, but they are going to be one of the countries who's going to achieve it. Uh, quickly, just going through uh, Luxembourg. 
So based on the work that we've done here, about 5,000 treated. Uh, Luxembourg, you guys have an amazing registry. So 2,600, we estimate, have been diagnosed. In 2018, um, it's about 130, but it's 125 that were treated. Here's the age distribution of the infections in, in Luxembourg. Um, so peaking around 50 years old. What do we need to do to achieve the elimination? The black line represents the status quo. Um, so we estimate the, the, the black line is how many people are getting a screen today. In order to do universal screening, we're going to have to screen, uh, we're going to have to ramp up to screen about 110,000 per year. Uh, and that's going to be for a single year and it's going to come back. Um, so diagnose approximately about 400 new cases. And then ramp up treatment. So again, remember, um, in Luxembourg, it, it peaked at about 300 in 2016, come, came down. Uh, given the current trends, it's going to continue to go down. But the green line represents what we have to do. So we're going to have to treat about 575 people annually to achieve the WHO elimination targets. If we do that, we save 124 deaths, 87 new HCC cases, 68 new decompensated cirrhosis. Black line represents the prevalence of Hep C in Luxembourg under status quo. If you go after the elimination target, this is how quickly the prevalence actually drops. You see the same thing drop in liver-related death, HCC, and decompensated cirrhosis. Now, what's interesting is you look at these lines and go, yeah, mathematical modeling, that's great. We've done very similar work actually with Australia, and what they're seeing in real life is actually tracks very, very closely to these green lights, green line actually. And they just recently published a paper on that. Um, so if you're interested, look that up. Now, what about the cost? Everybody keeps talking about the cost of, uh, of the elimination. Now, you know, how many people are, are familiar with the concept of cost effectiveness? See, sure. So for treatment diagnostics, you want to be cost effective. In fact, hepatitis C treatment and screening is not cost effective. It's cost saving. So in fact, countries will actually save money. They will spend less money as compared to doing nothing. Uh, we haven't done Luxembourg, but we did do Croatia, Greece, Spain, and Switzerland. And what you're seeing in the black line is the cumulative spending that Croatia will spend from 2017 forward under the status quo, which is if they continue doing what they're doing today. And so every year the cost keeps adding up, right? So we add the, the previous year to this year's cost, and this is the cumulative, right? This is the, what the government will actually spend. The green line represents if they went after WHO elimination target. And so what you notice is the green line is initially higher, which means that they will spend more in the initial years because they have to screen more and they have to treat more. But in fact, after 2029, once the the disease has been uh, eliminated. In fact, this, this spending will stay flat, so they, they won't spend any more, actually. So that's essentially a flat slope. Uh, and in fact, these are the cost saving. Same thing with Greece, spend more up front, and then it goes flat, so actually cumulative, you spend less. Spain, Spain is actually on track to achieve it uh, much faster by 2024. And Switzerland was a special case where actually they spend less up front because their, the treatment cost is so much lower than, than the Pegley and the Firon that they were buying. So you say, well, that's pretty, you know, that's a high income countries. What about low income countries? In fact, we see the same thing. So if you look at the graphs in for Uganda, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Nigeria, same story. Hepatitis C is very, very unique. There aren't that many diseases that are cost saving. So there's really not an economic argument of why we shouldn't be eliminating. In fact, we would save money. The question is, why aren't we doing it? And the Uganda is a, is a perfect example. Um, so if you look at this graph, the blue represents healthcare cost, um, tiny little for screening cost and, and then treatment. And so in fact, year after year, we see an increase in medical cost. More patients are advancing to advanced liver disease, requiring hospitalization, and so the healthcare cost actually goes up. The catch is the government is not paying for these. The patients are paying for it, right? So when we propose this idea that if you achieve, if you go after elimination, so what the government has to do is they have to pay for more screening. So look at the green lines, that's for screening, and the red is for treatment. But look at what happens to your healthcare cost. It goes down dramatically because you're going to have much fewer advanced liver disease cases, right? The government looked at this and it goes, we're not paying for the blue. 
So what you're arguing is for us to pay for the green and red, you know, spend more, and the patients are going to get the benefit of it. The answer is yes. That's the reason that the government, especially in low middle income countries, outside of a few, are, are not actually embracing the whole elimination. Because it's because today the patients are paying for it. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time because I actually want to have a discussion. But there are actually, now we have come up with some ideas for, um, uh, for um, how do you actually finance elimination in low and middle income countries. Um, and this is a program that we've implemented. Uh, actually, it's right now starting in Uzbekistan. Uh, we're going to screen 250,000 people in Uzbekistan for hepatitis C and B and put everyone who's hep B and hep C on treatment. And the way the system works, we call it catalytic investment. So catalyst, uh, remember I'm a chemist in background, right? So catalyst is what you add to a reaction. Uh, at the end of the reaction, you take that and then you add it to the next reaction. So you, as a catalyst, you never lose it. Catalytic investment is investment that you put in, but then you recover at the end of your program and then you go invest it someplace else. So how does it work? So we buy, we, we literally spend a million dollars uh, to buy diagnostics and treatments. And we, uh, so we placed orders with manufacturers and we shipped them to the pharmacies in Uzbekistan. So we have an agreement with the pharmacies and we shipped them to the polyclinics uh, in Uzbekistan. So there's about 40,000 rapid tests sitting in clinics and, and we have a corresponding number of therapies for hep B and hep C sitting in pharmacies. The, the screening, uh, all the lab tests is provided for free to the patients. So anyone walks through the door, in fact, the, the goal is to screen 1,000 people per day. They come through the door, through the public clinics, they get the test for free and they get the lab test for free. Now, we fully expect that 20% of the patients who are tested positive are going to say, thank you very much, not interested. Thanks for the free test and then move away. What we do is then we take the patients and we divide them into two segments. We say that 20% of the patients are never going to be able to pay, right? So you have this concept of catastrophic healthcare expenditure above which, you know, families go uh, into bankruptcy. 20% of the population, I don't care what the price is, they're not, not going to be able to afford. So that 20% of the patients has received free treatment. The remaining, we do ask them to pay for their treatment. And that payment actually then comes back to buy the next batch of diagnostics and treatments and does the same thing. So you guys remember the old cars where you kind of you know, turn the crank and once it gets going, it kind of keeps going? The catalytic investment, the upfront investment, it's about 1.7 million that's required. Gets the whole system going. The last set of payments then pays back the catalytic investment, and then we go back and invest it now. Start the same program in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Uganda. Now, you kind of take a look and say, oh, you know, hey, does this actually hold? The, the answer is actually yes, because remember, today the patients are paying for everything. So they get free screening for Hep B, free lab test for Hep B, free, 20% of the population receives the, um, the um, treatment for free. The, the patients who pay are going to be paying $110 per year. Today, they're paying to somewhere between three and four hundred. So, in fact, it's substantially less than what they're paying today. And um, this this 110 pays not only for the medicine, but it pays for the screening of the whole population. And the same thing for Hep C. Um, so, in fact, we do we have a lot of operation research that's actually going into really simplifying the testing and diagnostics. How do you move the patients? How do you move a thousand people per day through the system? We literally went with stopwatch and actually did that. Uh, and so we do feel pretty strongly that this program is, is, is gonna work. And uh, we like to think that it's actually gonna start at the end of the month. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here because I wanna open up to questions. Uh, at, the, at the current trajectory, very few countries are gonna actually achieve the elimination time. That, that, that is a fact, unless we do something differently. Second fact is, the elimination programs will cost societies less than doing nothing. And I want to underscore societies, not governments, but societies. So in high-income countries, in Western countries, the cost of the society and the cost of the government is the same, because you have national health care program. In low and middle income countries, the majority of the current healthcare expenditure is actually 
uh, the patients pay for. So that, that's where it gets kind of tricky. Uh, elimination program will require upfront investment. I, I don't want to beat around the bush. This is, this is actually, this is true. This is in every country, you're gonna to have to spend more, but you save a lot more. But there are good examples of where it costs you more upfront, but you save money. Buying a house is a great example, right? We wouldn't go be able to go and buy a house, but there's actually, you can get a mortgage, you pay an upfront payment, and you can get a mortgage. The initial idea behind the, uh, the UHA program that I, I showed was actually exactly that, which is why don't we just go and borrow money? Um, and, and, and countries get very nervous when they start thinking about borrowing. But, but think about it, actually bonds and borrowing money is actually a great way of funding these programs. Uh, we talked about the catalytic investment. Uh, we, did, we talked about how you need to treat more than 7% of the population. Um, I'm going to leave you with this. Without a, a universal screening, uh, the programs are going to lose momentum. That's given. Uh, we've seen ample evidence on that. Um, and simplified testing algorithm make universal screening cost effective. The rapid tests are less than $2 now. Uh, and in fact, you can screen loads of people uh, at very, very low cost. I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you very much. I, I think we need to redefine elimination for infectious diseases. I, I don't think that we need to change the reduction incidence. That, that's definitely needed, no, no question. What we need is an if statement in there that says if um, the infectious disease um, is, is, you know, will require a long duration uh, before any signs or symptoms develop, then we also require a reduction, 90% reduction in prevalence. So a great example is hepatitis B, right? So hep C, we don't have vaccines. For hep B, we do have vaccines. And in fact, we've made incredible headway in, um, in, in vaccination, e even in low-income countries. With the help of Gavi and others, now we can complain that countries still are not getting birth dose. But in fact, nearly every country is, is actually doing three-dose vaccination among children. So we have great vaccination. Yet, we have 260 million people globally infected with hep B and uh, we have close to a million people dying annually. So that's one death every 30 seconds. So what happened? We, we've reduced, I mean, if you look at the number of new infections for Hep B, we really have reduced it by 90% since prior to vaccination. We should have achieved elimination, right? But the burden continues. In fact, the number of deaths, Hep B deaths, continues to increase. And so this is this bolus that was infected 
prior to vaccination, start of vaccination. So, uh, you know, our, require, our request is that we put an if statement in there, which is if the signs and symptoms do not develop for long term, and uh, human papillomavirus is, is falls into that same category, then we would also require a 90% reduction in prevalence or management of the disease. So in Hep B, treat everyone, reduce the viral load, and keep them from progressing until they die of other causes. Um, we have had numerous discussions with CDC and uh, WHO. They don't buy it. Um, they are very cautious about deviating from current definitions. Um, but the facts are on our side. I mean, Hep B is a perfect example where you know, the majority of the focus when after vaccination Hep B is probably the largest global health failure of the late 20th century. I mean, think about it. One death every 30 seconds. We have vaccination, we have treatment, and still people are dying. And what happened was the whole global community focused on vaccination because of the traditional definition, forgetting about the treatment side of it. Uh, and, and what happened is, is people are continuing. In fact, the number of deaths as a result of Hep B just continues to increase year after year. Did I answer your question? Are there any questions, please? Yeah, thanks very much. You know, we, we call it the brother-in-law effect. Um, I have to tell you, as a decision analyst, I was absolutely shocked, right? They, they, so, you know, they, they, the role of a decision analyst is to run the analyses, provide data to support good decision making. So, you know, we go through these analyses and, and we're sitting down with the governments and, uh, you know, they kind of shake their head. And, yeah, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Thank you very much. It's like, this is insane. I mean, you look at the number of deaths averted in Ethiopia, you know, 40,000 deaths. What people don't want to talk about, and it's a reality in public health, is the corruption in uh, low and low and middle income in middle income countries. Actually, it's always somebody's brother-in-law who's got their own laboratory, who's got their own pharmaceutical distribution center, right? And uh, these systems are inefficient. I mean, these healthcare systems are incredibly inefficient. Well, we were in Ethiopia, and so we were doing the economic analysis, and we said, "Look, what does it cost to do a PCR?" In, in Ethiopia for Hep C. It's a $200 per patient. $200, I know, that's insane. So we go to Roche and we go to Abbott, like, look guys, this is ridiculous. You know, I can get PCRs in the US, I can get in Europe for cheaper than that. And I said, look, that's not what we're charging. What we're selling the reagents is less than 30 bucks. By the time it gets to patients, it's, it's $200. And we cannot control what happens in, in the chain. This is the reality, and this is what actually one of the reasons we formed GPRO. So uh, one of the things that we do is the, uh, the negotiation, actually, uh, with the pharmacies and with the labs. And we say, look, um, so not, not only the, uh, but yeah, simplified, but markup negotiation. So we sit down with the labs and we say, look, what we're going to do is we're going to provide you these you get to increase the price by 5%, and that's all you get to do. That mechanism does not exist in a lot of these settings, and so you have these massive markups uh, that makes it. You know, a Hep B vaccine, a birth dose vaccine, we were surprised in Africa. Parents are not providing Hep B vaccine. It's 15 cents. You can get a Hep B vaccine 
through yeah, UNICEF for 15 cents. And so we're working in Africa, and we said, well, why don't you guys just buy it? I mean, 15 cents. I mean, anybody can afford that. So, oh, it's not 15 cents. It's $50 there. Like, how does it go from 15 cents to $50? So when we go through the supply chain, and we go through the chain, they're absolutely right. By the time we go to the pharmacy to pick up a birth dose vaccine, it's $50. And so the way that we were able to accomplish this in the world of HIV is these global donors are donating all the medicine, all the diagnostics, and they're controlling the supply chain all the way through. For HIV, those markets are completely efficient, and there's complete transparencies. You go outside of HIV, HIV, TB, and malaria, the markets completely fail, and it's absolute total chaos. I mean, anything goes. It's unbelievable. Yeah, Joe, please. Um, yeah, yeah, no, in fact, they agreed to $14, actually, yeah. So we did. We negotiated with, with them to get the lowest. And the pharmacy was even more interesting. So, you know, the pharmacies charge 15% markup from the time that they get the medication. Now, there's a lot of steps below that. We said, look, we're not going to go through any supply chain. We get the product. We're going to take the product and ship them to your pharmacies. Um, and so they actually reduced their markup from 15% to 5% uh, for this program. It's completely doable. It is absolutely completely doable. Um, it's just that there's no single agent that's really driving this process. And so essentially chaos takes over and individual optimization starts taking place. And so you have 20% markup here, 20% up there. And before you know it, you go from 15 cents per vaccine to $50 per vaccine by the time it gets to the patient. And, and this whole idea actually came from the patients in Africa. What they were telling us was if, if we can get it for, you know, if we can get Tenofovir for Hep B at $4 a month, we'll buy it. It's just that we can't. We're getting it at $50 to $70 a month for, per bottle. And, you know, this is my MBA part. I was kind of looking at it like, this is a no-brainer. So, I mean, we, we should be able to go and manage the supply chain. Um, so talk to me in about a year, because, yeah, that whole program is in place and the government. So we got the uh, parliament of Uzbekistan to write a decree that this program gets a special designation that it actually just bypasses all the supply chains. Um, the, the private labs, and, and you know, a lot of people are very unhappy, but it is something that's going to really benefit the patients. No, that's a great question. That's a really good question. And this is something we struggle with quite a bit. Um, so, so remember, everybody gets screening for free because we didn't want to create any biases. So anybody who walks through the door, um, they have to bring their passport because they don't have a national ID. They have to, get a, they have to come in with their passport. So they get the, 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 the screening and all the lab tests for free, independent of the income level. The question that we were struggling with is how do you decide who cannot and can afford treatment. Now, if you look at the HIV literature, there is a series of questionnaires that you can ask that can indicate the ability to pay. There's been a number of studies in India and Africa where you ask them, you know, do you have a TV? Do you have a washing machine? And so on. In Uzbekistan, we lucked out completely. I mean, it had nothing to do with being smart. It was just lucky. Each neighborhood in Uzbekistan, and this is from the Soviet era, has a group of elders. And these elders decide um, who would be eligible for social security services. So if you have too many family, uh, too many members of the family and not enough income, 
or if you have someone who's injured, uh, who cannot work. The elders actually provide a piece of documentation and they get uh, food for free, um, they get health care for free. Um, and so it was actually, in Uzbekistan, it was quite simple. Um, so the recommendation was just follow the same thing. I mean, why would you come up with a parallel system to decide who can and cannot pay? Um, so we'll see. We'll see. In fact, it turns out in, in, in Uzbekistan, they have a list of people who are under this program, uh, the Social Security program. In Tashkent, the city that we're going to be conducting, uh, only 10% of the population falls in this category. Once you go into the rural area, that number gets much bigger. So on average, throughout the country, it's 20%. But in, in fact, uh, we may be having way too much free treatment available. Um, so we may have a supply chain problem of having too much. Because there was, the government was saying, look, in the, in the, in the city that you're conducting this pilot, uh, yeah, the number of people that qualify for Social Security is only 10% of the population. You know, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the data. That's it. So we work with Ameren and, and some of the folks in Georgia quite closely. But you're saying that they were treated, they just didn't achieve SVR. They didn't, they were not cured after treatment. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, the numbers that I, I have seen is much, it's, it's closer to 90 to 95% of all treated were cured. Uh, because they're using uh, soft uh, lead and now soft vel, actually, uh, which are quite uh, decent medication. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't know why they're not, yeah, they're not achieving SVR. Yeah. Yeah, so these are all licensed generics. So these are generics that have a license uh, from the, the, the manufacturers. Um, I'll be honest with you, everybody, when we applied for funding for this, uh, we, we were turned down. Everybody thinks we're absolutely crazy. Uh, but if it works, it will completely change the landscape of how you can fund healthcare um, in these settings. Now, there's a subtle thing that we, we didn't discuss with this. The prevalence of Hep B in Uzbekistan is significantly higher than Hep C, right? The cost of Hep B medication is significantly lower. So it's, it's around, uh, to, to purchase, we're selling it for $11, but we're buying it at about $3, right? So the difference is going to pay for the screening, and the free screening, free lab test, all, all of that, right? So you can, you can pay $3 per month for Hep B patients. For Hep C, um, it's around $90 per patient for cure, right? Um, and, and so that, that's the generics that we're buying. 
So one of the things that we look at, at is this, cat uh, this catastrophic healthcare expenditure, which is how high the price has to be, how low does it have to be in order for not to send a family into bankruptcy. So we came up with this idea, we we're like, look, uh, what if we take a portfolio approach? What if we increase the price of the, the cost of the hep B patients by $2? Because the prevalence is higher, so much higher, you can actually reduce the hep C cost by 10 to $20 actually, right? And, and you still get the catalytic funding and so on. So the incremental cost of the hep B patient is quite small. The cost saving to the hep C patients is really high. Um, and so on our advisory board, we have USCDC, we have WHO, and they were dead against this. They were like, that, you, know, you can't do that. However, let, let's pretend we can't do that. For universal health care, you got, the majority of the population in these the low-income settings have diabetes, they have cardiovascular diseases. These medications are quite cheap, actually. If you take the same portfolio approach, this could be the paradigm for uh, universal health care. Because now you can offer cancer medication. The prevalence, the incidence of cancer is, is quite low in these countries, but the cost is quite high. So you can bring the cost of cancer therapy down below the catastrophic healthcare expenditure and increase the cost of diabetic drugs or cardiovascular drugs by one or two dollars. You do that, now all of a sudden universal healthcare is quite feasible in these settings. Um, so we'll see, we, we have to convince a lot of people. I, I, at first we, we were gonna do that and, and they, they told us they would be dead against it if we even think about it. But that's how insurance works, right? You're healthy, you pay into insurance, and then that pays for the people who are sick. So essentially, it's, it's kind of an economic equivalent to that, which is, look, you know, you have a chronic disease, very low cost, pay slightly more, very tiny, one or two dollars more, but then you can reduce the cost of low prevalence, low incidence diseases significantly, uh, and still come out of the same place, actually, from a total expenditure. And that's a great question. Um, so it, it depends on the country. So universal screening would be essentially all adults uh, in the country. Um, and we're doing a lot of work right now with New Zealand, who's going to start a universal screening. I, I think what makes sense in, in Luxembourg is, is to start essentially as age 30 and higher to capture the majority of the population. Because remember, if you look at the, uh, the population pyramid, um, th that shape uh, is going to be different. So if we go 30 and higher, you capture most of the, the population. And then you can go back once the screening is, the campaign is done and then go mop up actually and pick up the rest actually. Now what's interesting is, is let me show you this. Uh, the, the, the importance of a registry is, is, is really key. Sorry, just bear with me. So, so we were working with New Zealand. We said, look, do you guys know how much it costs you to find one new case? They're like, well, it's probably around $200, $250, right? So they pay about $12 for anti-HCV and about $230 for a PCR test in New Zealand, right? So we came back and we said, all right, let's do some math, right? Your prevalence is 1.1%, so this is an uncertainty tree. Um, and, uh, and then your viremic rate is 76%, and 50% of the population is already diagnosed. So to find the one person who's never been diagnosed, you're gonna have to find two people. And if it's all random, one of them is gonna be or know that they're already infected. But to find two people, you're gonna have to do testing, uh, 2.6 RNA test, actually, to find two. To find 2.6 people who are RNA positive, 
you're going to need to run 239 anti-HCV tests. Okay? So you know what the cost of anti-HCV is, you know what the cost of RNA is. Today, New Zealand, it costs them almost $3,500 to find one patient. That's huge, right? So the kind of scratched their head, going, ah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So we went away, we come back in three months, they're like, okay, we got it. So, so now what? I said, all right, so one of the things you can do is, is you can focus on high risk population. So if you focus on high risk population, and let's say your prevalence is 50%, you still have to find 2.6, you still have to have two. So these numbers stay the same, but you're gonna have to screen a lot less. So in high risk population, the cost to find one new case is, to, you know, is six, $700. They're like, okay, we want to do high risk. Yeah, the problem with high risk is you're not going to be able to find everyone, right? So 80% of your population is outside of high risk. So what's the solution? I said, the solution is actually really simple. Put a national registry in place. If you have a national registry where you're not sampling people, you're not testing people randomly, so you can either have a registry in place or you can send out vouchers. Every adult in the country gets a voucher to come in for one test, actually. Now, you're not actually, so, so sorry, no, I missed one step. So let, let's go to see what the cost of finding one new case in 2025 is going to be in New Zealand. The anti-HCV prevalence always stays the same, right? Anti-HCV, all it tells you is have they ever been exposed. But if you test and treat, your viremic rate now is 20%, and only 15% of your population is undiagnosed. So in fact, by 2025, your cost is going to be $44,000 to find one case, one new case. If you have a national registry, or if you have a voucher system, essentially what you're doing is you're guaranteeing that you only screen among people who are undiagnosed previously. You're not double testing, triple testing. So you're, you're under, your diagnosis rate is zero among this population. Your viremic rate, if they've never been treated, if they get a voucher and you, you know they haven't been, will always stay 76%, and your anti-HCV. So in fact, your cost is substantially lower. So not only they took this, but then they went to the manufacturers, to the diagnostic manufacturers. They negotiated the cost of anti-HCV to $1 and their RNA test is around $20 now. So the beauty of a universal screening is you, you don't have to do it using current cost. Once you go to universal sc screening, now you can actually reduce your cost substantially by going to the manufacturer and saying, look, we want to implement the universal screening. We're going to be testing, in case of Luxembourg, 400,000 people. And uh, you know, we want to have much lower prices. And they, they will do it. They will definitely. So that's what New Zealand is doing. They're going to start with the South Island first um, and, and implement it. And then if it's successful, expand it to uh, North Island where most of the population is. Thank you. Sure. So there are many applications. Thank you. I'd just like to say for Luxembourg, So let me ask you a question. Uh, so this is something we saw in Israel. Um, patient privacy is um, less of an issue in Israel. So they, they, they have very similar registry. But what they did was they actually went and, and dug up the patient's name, number, address, and they contacted everyone who's ever been diagnosed with, with hep C. And said, look, the, the treatment is free. We want you to come in. With something similar, I mean, the, you know, the beauty of Luxembourg is you've already diagnosed over 50% of the population. Is there a legally a viable way of actually approaching everyone who's in the registry and contacting them? 
I see. Yeah. I see. So we like to either retest the uh, uh, or the registry, uh, we, we did the same for each other, for example. And we see a lot of people using it every day. And so we, yeah, we have always to choose the registry. Interesting. So we can have that access. But we have always new, new people coming in the country. So we have other challenges with the urban villages to work with. Yeah. No, this is a really interesting problem because it really goes into this whole concept of a global ID, a patient ID, that, uh, you know, that they would, if they're diagnosed, there's a global repository that has the patient ID. You know, we, this, this whole thing with the migration into Europe is really causing a problem because it's hard to keep track of whether they're in Turkey, Greece, Albania, and move, they're moving through Europe. Um, and I know that politically that's very, very difficult to implement something like that. Right. Because, you know, if the patient then comes up all of a sudden in Spain and they know that they've been diagnosed mm -hmm. in Luxembourg, like, oh, you've already been diagnosed. Yeah, let's get, yeah, let's get you under care. Uh, but without that, it's impossible. You know, but, but it's not that it's not that dissimilar to the U.S. You know, as people move from one state to the other, uh, we lose them. Um, so it's, it's, it is quite difficult, actually. I, th I think it's a dilemma between public health, the needs of a public health system, and, and, and then you know the legal framework and what how much you, you know you can do with that within that framework. In the, in the US, they refer to that patient identification because they would not they, they didn't see that as a uh, country they were from. They should share the CDC with the Right, right. Yeah, it was fairly unique. Right, right. All right, so you guys think we can eliminate uh, in Luxembourg by 2030? All right, let's see a show of hands. How many people, after this presentation, or you don't know, how many people believe in universal screening in Luxembourg after this presentation? Let's see a show of hands. Uh, it's a good idea. Let's just start with that. How many people think it's a good idea? All right. Now, how many people think it's doable? <laughs> Perfect. Well, we, we, can, we can create some framework, actually. Yeah, John Ward uh, from USCD, he used to be the head of the viral hepatitis program at USCDC. He's pro providing, he's creating this uh, database on best practices. Um, and, and that's one of the objectives he has, is to see how countries are doing, implementing various programs, and whether it can be uh, transferred to other countries as well. You know, Brazil screens 7 million people for hep C. Uganda has screened 4 million for hep B. Um, as you know, uh, Mongolia has screened 65% of all adults for hep C. Egypt, 52 million. It's, it's quite doable. It's just a matter of the political will to be able to implement something like this. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.